Hello and welcome to week four, part five of EGM 703, Applications of Passive Microwave Remote Sensing. In this lesson, we'll learn about different scientific applications of passive microwave remote sensing. We'll look at examples of how passive microwave remote sensing can be used to study soil moisture, sea surface temperature and salinity, sea ice, and also different types of snow studies. As always, these are not the only applications out there, but a small selection. Before we jump right in, we should talk a little bit about emitted or passive microwaves and how we measure these. We can divide instruments that measure passive microwave radiation into two main varieties. The first, sounding radiometers, are primarily used to study atmospheric properties. The second, imaging radiometers, operate a bit more like what we're used to. The antenna of the sensor moves in order to create a two-dimensional image of the radiation that is emitted from a given area. Now remember, the radiation emitted by an object in the microwaves is typically very low, and this means that the signal received tends to be very weak. Because the amount of radiation measured by the sensor is related to the size of the antenna, just like real aperture radar, we typically need to have an impossibly large antenna to get high resolution images. So as a result, we're typically talking about ground sampling distances on the order of a few kilometers. A few recent examples of passive radiometers are the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer 2, or AMSER 2. This instrument rotates its antenna across an angle of 122 degrees as it moves along its track giving it a swath of about 1,450 kilometers. The second example that we'll look at is the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite, which used a combination of a SAR instrument to measure reflectance, which helps us to work out emissivity, and a scanning radiometer to measure the emitted radiation. The antenna for this instrument rotated in a full circle as it orbited, covering a 1,000 kilometer wide swath. We'll see a few examples of what the data collected by these sensors was used for as we move on in this lesson. The amount of radiation emitted from soil has a very strong dependence on the soil moisture content. To see why, consider that the real part of the dielectric constant for dry soil, epsilon r prime, is about 3.5, while for water it's over 20 times that at about 80. You can see in the graphs here how this varies for different soil moisture percentages. The graph on the left shows how the real part of the dielectric constant uh, varies, while the one on the right shows the imaginary part. From this, we can also see that the penetration depth for soil will also depend on the moisture content. Wet or saturated soil has a lower penetration depth than dry soil. The emissivity for saturated soil at about 5 gigahertz for C-band microwaves is about 0.6, while for dry soil it's above 0.9. Other things that we have to keep in mind for estimates of soil moisture are vegetation cover, penetration depth that's mentioned above, and the different sensor parameters including the frequency or wavelength, the viewing angle, and the polarization. All of these have an impact on what the sensor actually measures and whether we can effectively estimate the soil moisture content from those measurements. Like for other surfaces, the radiation emitted by the ocean surface is dependent on the physical properties of the ocean, such as the temperature, as well as the chemical properties, such as the salinity. From the graph on the left here, we can see how the derivative of the measured brightness temperature varies with respect to the sea surface salinity, SSS. This varies as both a function of frequency as well as a function of viewing angle. The vertical red line here highlights the 1.4 to 1.4 to 7 gigahertz band, which is protected for radio astronomy. At these frequencies, we don't have to worry as much about interference from other transmitters, making this a popular, uh, a popular band to observe passive microwaves in. On the right, we can also see how the relationship between brightness temperature and salinity changes with the sea surface temperature. In order to accurately 
accurately estimate the sea surface salinity, we need to know the sea surface temperature. Similar to many of the other applications that we've discussed over the course of this module, other things that we have to keep in mind are things like the component of the radiation measure that has been reflected from other sources, atmospheric effects, ionospheric effects, and surface roughness, all of which changes the amount of radiation that is recorded by the sensor. Two different example satellites or sensors that we can use to estimate sea surface salinity are the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity Satellite, or SMOS, operated by ESA and launched in 2009. And another one is one we've seen already, the Soil Moisture Act Passive Mission, which operated in 2015. In general, ice crystals emit more energy than liquid water does at microwave wavelengths. This means that we can use the emitted microwave radiation to differentiate between open ocean and sea ice. Using techniques similar to spectral unmixing, we can also estimate the concentration of ice in a given pixel. And with enough years of data, we can also look at trends in ice extent over time. We've been using passive microwaves to study sea ice extents and concentrations from space since about 1978. Another thing that we can use passive microwaves to do is to estimate the age of sea ice. As sea ice survives the summer melt season, its physical and chemical properties change. This so-called multi-year ice contains less brine as it has been effectively flushed out during the melt season. It also has more air pockets and it tends to be stiffer and stronger than first year ice. All of these images come from the National Snow and Ice Data Center or NSIDC which keeps records of the extent, concentration, and age of sea ice in both the Arctic and Antarctic, measured using passive microwave remote sensing, as well as other techniques. Snow crystals help to scatter emitted radiation, which means that deep snow tends to have a lower brightness tem temperature due to the increased number of scatterers present, at least when we compare it to shallow snowpacks. Using Using the measured radiation emitted by the ground surface, we can actually estimate the depth of the snowpack over time, as is illustrated here. This map from a 2008 study by Che et al. shows the distribution of the average winter snow depth in China from the, over the period 1978 to 2006, based on data from two microwave radiometers, the Scanning Multi-Channel Microwave Radiometer, or SMMR, and the Special Sensor Microwave Imager, or SSMI. To accurately map snow depths using these data sets, we need to first consider the snow conditions. For example, the grain size and density, which will also affect the brightness temperature measured by the sensor. As always with microwave remote sensing, the presence of liquid water also has a strong impact. Wet snow emits very differently from dry snow, and as a result, it's more difficult to estimate snow depth using the emitted microwave radiation. We also need to consider vegetation cover, as this will have an impact on the brightness temperature measured by the sensor. And finally, we need to consider precipitation, because it shows a similar scattering signature to snow in certain frequency bands. As snow melts, its emissivity changes. Dry snow behaves more like a volumetric scatterer, while wet snow behaves more like a surface scatterer, with an emissivity that very nearly approaches one. While we can't use wet snow to map snow depths, we can use wet snow to map melt extents, as illustrated here for the Greenland ice sheet. Using SSMI data, this 1995 study by Abdullahi and Stefan shows the annual melt extent on Greenland for the period 1988 to 1991. 1991 is not pictured. The emitted radiation measured by the sensor also depends on the polarization. By comparing the signal in different bands at different polarizations and taking a threshold value, we can map when melt has occurred in a, for a given location as illustrated by the graph here, which shows the normalized difference between the brightness temperature in the horizontally polarized 19 gigahertz channel and the brightness temperature in the vertically polarized 37 gigahertz channel of the SSMI, SSMI sensor. From the plot, 
we see how the onset of melt in the two years when a research camp was established and how this lines up with where the normalized difference goes above the chosen threshold value of minus 0 0.25 or 0 0.025. In this lesson, we've discussed how we have two main flavors of passive microwave systems, imaging radiometers and sounding radiometers. Sounding radiometers are primarily used for measuring atmospheric properties, while imaging radiometers are used for a number of different purposes. Because the levels of radiation emitted at microwave wavelengths are very low, these sensors tend to have a very low spatial resolution. Despite this, there are a number of important climate applications of passive re microwave remote sensing, including soil moisture, sea surface properties, sea ice, and others. Uh, as always, I've included links to the different articles that are referenced in the presentation here. They're also available on the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions of the articles in the Zotero library. There's also a link to the data available from the NSIDC on the sea ice index, as well as a, a presentation um, hosted by uh, the University of Colorado which discusses a few more uh, applications of passive microwave remote sensing for climate studies. Um, so that's all I have for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye.